Well, it is great to see you again. And thank you so much for having me back on the show. It has been too many years and way too long since we've had the opportunity to catch up. Just as a, a quick refresher, maybe for people who didn't hear the last conversation or, or maybe new to, to your show. I am Michael Reddington. I'm a certified forensic interviewer and executive resource. And a lot of times when I say those two things back to back, people look at me like, what? what? What did you just say? So believe it or not, I transitioned from a full time career in interview and interrogation to a full time career working with CEOs and sales teams and HR teams, because surprisingly to some, the very best leaders and the very best interrogators capitalize on the same two core skills, vision and influence. In the cognitive process that interrogation suspects experience when they truthfully commit to saying I did it is essentially identical to the cognitive processes that customers experience when they say I'll buy it and employees experience when they say I'll do it. So once I came to those two realizations, when I made the career transition, started in Quasive, dedicated myself to serving as an executive resource, and began work on what eventually became the discipline listening method. And I'm really excited to be back here today to answer all of your questions and see where this conversation takes us. Well, awesome, Mike. It's great to see you again. I, I loved our first conversation. I've listened to it a lot. It's been one of the most listened to podcasts that we've had in our previous 77 episodes. So Obviously, you and what you do and your message are, are resonating with a lot of people. Um, just in your intro there, I got a bunch of questions and I didn't write them down, so I hope I remember them. But what I do have on my notes here is um, for those that are watching and a lot of our audience chooses to watch as opposed to listening, driving down the freeway, like I tend to do with my podcasts, um, the company is, in, is up on the screen behind you in Quasive, Strategic Ethical Persuasion. I'm going to read what you have on your website for our audience about what that word inquasive um, means, because I, I get that that's a word that you invented. And um, I, although I don't know, I hear it. And for some reason, I understand what it means, even if I didn't know you. But according to Mike Reddington, inquasive is an adjective to studiously observe others and ethically persuade commitments to sharing the strategic intelligence required to affect positive change. Lots of words, but good words. I think they're, they're all very powerful words that have a lot of meaning to all of us. Can you tell me a little bit about the journey of how you came to the word inquasive? And um, other than your definition there, now that you've had it for a while, it's probably been a, a minute since you wrote that. Yes. Has that definition changed? Has it migrated into something else? Has it evolved? What does the word inquasive now mean to you? And how did you come up with that name? I appreciate it. So how I came up with it, I'll keep this long story short, but not too far down the freeway from you. I spent a long time one year in San Diego or a lot of time one year in San Diego working with various clients. And the group that was in charge of this project that I was working on was tied into a marketing company that had worked with a bunch of celebrities and had done all kinds of crazy work. And I got to sit in with them when they were helping startups come up with their company name and their on like their startup strategy and all these things. So I was taking notes. Nice. Just to participate in those conversations. But I saved all those notes. So when it came to me having to start a company and figure out what I was going to call it and all those things, I knew the Mike Reddington company was a non-starter. <laughs> so you know, how was I going to come up with something that I could own that was unique, that represented what I do, but also would hopefully inspire some curiosity? Like people wouldn't hear it and just write it off. It might create a what does that mean sort of reaction from them to start the conversation. And so to keep a very long and boring story short, over multiple plane rides, I wrote down every single word I could think of that ties into the work that I do. And once I bored myself to death with that exercise, <laughs> I put them into categories. And then I started whittling down my favorite words from each category. And eventually, yada, 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 came down to inquire and persuasive. Hmm. And when you put inquire and persuasive together, you have inquasive. And I felt like I accomplished all of the goals that I set out to with naming the organization. And you're right. It's been years since I wrote that original definition. I do absolutely think it still applies because when we think about being inquasive or when we think about the discipline listening method, there really are two sides to that coin that are constantly flipping. There's the strategic observation side, because how I take in what I believe other people are communicating to me is going to impact what I how I communicate in return. 
And then there's that persuasive communication side, because how I communicate with you is going to really impact how you communicate with me. So that cycle is always turning. And I do feel like that definition in the word inquisitive does a good job representing that. And I like it because it brings to mind the word inquisitive, obviously. Yes. And I know that was part part of your intention. I would yeah. imagine. Autocorrect reminds me of that every time. Yeah, probably every time you type, <laughs> trust me, every time I've typed it, when I've typed about our podcast or when you and I've been texting or emailing or what have you, it goes to inquisitive. Inquisitive brings up another word for me that's been really big on my mind. And I actually have a friend who we've been talking a lot lately about creating a conference or, or something on the word curiosity. How so inquisitive makes me think of inquisitive, which makes me think of curiosity. So now I'm going to see what the word curiosity means to you in the work that you do. It is one of the pillars. Curiosity is so important. You know, we, we've talked about our families. I have a young son. Right. I go out of my way to try to inflame his curiosity. Like I will answer all of his questions, no matter how ridiculous or how many times in a row he says why, because <laughs> I want to develop that curiosity in him. And I, I feel like as listeners, I, I guess I'll take a half a step back. And a lot of the programs we teach, we highlight that oftentimes if we were going to use business categories, the worst listeners are senior executives and technical experts. Hmm. And if somebody happens to be a senior executive and a technical expert in the technical field, forget about we it. You can double down my yeah. condolences. But yeah. the reason being is because their education, their experience, their expertise, the number of problems they've solved, the time compressed environment that they work in typically limits their motivation to be curious and find more information and typically incentivizes them to listen for the first opportunity to share their expertise to solve a problem. So it actually just, it doesn't make them bad people. It just is more likely to short circuit the process of listening. So listening equals learning, right? I can't be the only person in the world that thinks that if you're not learning, you're not listening. And the only way we can learn is by being curious. I was I was facilitating a program not too long ago. And one of the executives in the program, I've started telling this story more and I hope he doesn't hear this and take it the wrong way. Um, <laughs> raised give his me hand. his name or I'm going to tag him on LinkedIn. <laughs> with this video. Yeah. Um, he raised his hand. I won't even tell you what city I was in. There he you raised go. his hand um, and said, I really need you to help me learn more about how to listen today. Now, mind you, we're already two hours into a four hour presentation when he asked the question. So either I'm doing a really terrible job mm. or he hasn't been paying attention. And he says, for instance, with my wife. And as soon as he says that, I'm backpedaling. Like, I don't know what's coming next, but I want nothing to do with it. Like, him. dude, I'm not a marriage therapist here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Talk to my wife about the things I need to improve if you really <laughs> want to have that conversation. Um, but he said it takes her 15 minutes to say something that she should say. in two. And after two minutes, I can't listen anymore. And I looked at him, honestly, without really thinking through what I was saying next and said, I can't teach you how to care. Awesome. And I'm not saying that he doesn't care about his wife. Right. But I am saying that he didn't care enough about what she was saying in that moment to listen 121 seconds. I love that. And so when we think about listening... If we don't have a reason to care, if we don't have a reason to be involved in the conversation, we're going to space out. We're going to go away. So a huge part of curiosity is giving us that reason to care, that learning something, experiencing something unexpected, finding that perspective, that idea we never saw coming. If we can't be curious, we literally can't listen effectively. So other than the obvious looking at their watch or looking away or what are, what are some of the other telltale signs as, as you're speaking that someone may not be listening? Things that they're, are the less obvious. Their feet aren't pointing at me. That's one that a lot of people- Indication you use that the they've already turned to whatever's next, basically. Yeah. And mm -hmm. a lot of times it starts gradually. So let's just say there's a door to my right-hand side. My right foot, if, if you and I are talking and I'm checked out, right, I got to be somewhere else. The first thing that will likely happen if this is a gradual onset, I mean, if it's instant, I'm just going. But yeah, if it's a gradual onset, my right foot is likely going to start pointing towards the door because that is my body subconsciously starting to register. Like, I got to go. I'm out of here. I'm not listening anymore. Mm -hmm. So I, if I can see that, now I've got two choices. Number one, I can try to recapture your attention if this is really important. Or number two, depending on the context of the situation, I can wrap it up and let you go. 
So now I'm not offending you. I'm not upsetting you. I'm not making the situation worse. And I can always revisit the conversation later. But yeah, typically the, you know, the foot will start to point. They might actually start to lean. They might turn their shoulders. They might start looking at the door, checking their watch, all those other, you know, signs that people try to politely tell you, stop talking so I can leave. <laughs> So you're, I mean, I'm jumping down my notes, but because we are where we are in the conversation right now, that word discipline means a lot to a lot of people. I mean, you take the word disciple, obviously follower, you take the mm -hmm. word, you know, or an advocate or a believer. Mm -hmm. um, so talk to me about the term disciplined in front of the word listening and how can I, and I'm going to talk about Ed Hart for a moment, because I make a living talking to and listening to people, you know, not just here on the podcast, but talking with family businesses, talking with my boss, talking with the people around me at work, talking with my friends, my wife, obviously I should have started with that. Um, <laughs> you know, sorry, I'm going to rewind. It's like, I make a living listening to people like my wife and no, I'm just kidding. But, um, how can I, what coaching would you give me? Not so much based on what you know about me. We've never been in the same room together to my knowledge. Um, but we've talked a lot over the last couple of years. How can I discipline myself better to be a better listener? <clears throat> For me, yeah, it starts with how do we prioritize why we are communicating with people? So a lot of times, and I'll do this in the programs I teach, you know, we'll ask re a room full of really successful people outclassing me. You know, why do you listen? Oh, to learn, to build culture, to gain perspective, to get buy-in. Really? Because I'm pretty sure most of the time we're listening for the first opportunity to chime in, mm -hmm. to defend what we already think and believe, to decide if this conversation is valuable enough to listen to or not, or the first indication that I don't have to listen anymore. And you start to watch the head nod and the embarrassed smiles. And it's, yeah, like, how are we really doing this? So when we talk about the culture of disciplined listening, it's really predicated on two core tenets. Number one, focusing on unlocking hidden value in every important conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, you're at the bar at the airport, just, yeah, yeah, that got a death till he leaves you alone and you can have your beer in peace. But if you're talking to your wife, if you're talking to a family business representative, a lot of the community work that you do, you know, if you're talking, if you're having a conversation with somebody, there's a real opportunity to move a relationship or an initiative forward. I want to be really focused, not just on what they're saying, but what they're feeling, the totality of the message. And not just the main point of the message, but sometimes even that tangential or almost the throwaway polite pieces of the conversation, you know, there's real value there if I'm paying close enough attention. So, so that's one core tenant. The second is how do I create the communication experience other people need hmm. in order to achieve the goals or reach the potential of this relationship or this initiative? All too often, and believe it or not, this comes from the interrogation room, all too often we go into conversations focused on what do I want to say right. or what does this person need to do? And that's all driven from our, lack of a better word, ego, our bias, our expectations. And then we end up wondering why our perfectly rational solutions did a real terrible job solving an emotional problem that our counterpart is experiencing. It made sense in our brain. How come mm -hmm. it didn't work for them? But if I can step back and start saying, OK, if I'm going to have a conversation with Ed and it's about you know, raising money for a community project or whatever it might be, in order for us to reach that goal together, what does Ed have to experience while he's communicating with me in order to feel it's OK for him? Not only OK, but he wants to open up and share sensitive information under vulnerable circumstances in the face of consequences. So. Really those two, focusing on unlocking hidden value and creating the communication experiences that other people need. So really trying to figure out, I'm, I'm picturing myself in conversations over the last few days at different events that I've attended. And I mean, here it is, we're recording this on a Friday. This week, I've probably been to five or six meetings with lots of people. And at some point during that meeting, someone comes up to me or I approach someone else and they start talking, whatever it is they're talking about. <laughs> I don't mean that like I'm not listening, but there's been a lot of topics over the last sure, few sure. days in these conversations. What I'm hearing you say is we need to strive to try to understand. And, and the, the, the focus of my podcast is to get to the why. Why mm -hmm. does Michael Reddington run Inquisive? And why are you a certified forensic investigator? And why do you do? Why do you do? So to really fully understand the why behind this conversation. 
It's not just an, in some cases it is just an idle chit chat. Like you said, it's just a, you know, two people passing a quick hello. How you doing? Hope you're having a great day. Hope to see you next week. What have you. But oftentimes there is a why behind it. Can you, can you coach me a little bit on, on questions? I've read some of, you know, things in your books and, you know, on your site and in conversations with you before of ways that, and I'm leading up to as a leader of a family business, which is majority of our audience on this, on this podcast, um, getting to the, the why someone walks into my office to sit down and talk to me. Yeah. They might just be coming in just to have a conversation or just to engage, but what are ways that I can really dissect and get down to the why behind why they might be coming in to talk to me as an example? Yeah. The core premise is we should be going out of our way to help them save face, which is more difficult in family businesses than most other businesses. Sure. Yeah. Because now you have potential emotion. Yeah, a lot of emotion, a lot of personal connection, and also competing roles. So just as one potential example, you might have a son who doesn't have the leadership role at home, but in some capacity, maybe total capacity, has the leadership role in the office. So now you have these conflicting roles. Well, I'm supposed to be the father. I'm supposed to be the leader. I'm supposed to be the one in charge. Well, I'm the son. I see this differently. Like so the competing family business roles add much, much, much more fuel to that fire. So conceptually, how do we help people save face? And how do we focus on the issue, not the person with the questions that we ask? Hmm. So a couple general examples, and I'm happy to get as specific as you would like. We can yeah, just take it where you'd like, you bet. But a couple general examples. Um, if we are going to ask somebody if they're going to get something done on time, well, if you just say to somebody, are you going to get this done on time? The implied expected answer is yes. If I say no, I'm embarrassed and I'm opening myself up to consequences. So the right thing for me to do, true or not, is just say yes, walk away, try to make it happen, and then come up with an excuse as to why I couldn't if it turns out I missed the deadline. So instead, if we ask the question in a way that helps them save face and focuses on the issue, not the person, now I might phrase the question along the lines of, Hey, it's been a crazy couple of weeks dealing with not having everybody on the team here every day. Customer changed what they wanted at the last minute. So just keeping those things in mind, how many extra resources might I need to consider allocating to make sure this project is completed on time? So now if the project's not going to be on time, they have a golden parachute to say, thank you for asking. As a matter of fact, it would be great if you could. Now, maybe you'll give them, maybe you won't, but now you know the truth. Whereas if you were to say, are you going to get this done on time? There's only one acceptable answer to that question. Right. And I can't be mad if somebody gives it to me and it's not the truth because that's the situation I put them in. Yeah. So that would be one. Um, another one could be in a situation where let's say somebody hasn't shared information that would have been helpful, which I'm sure potentially could happen more in a family business than other businesses because of what we just said, you know, the power dynamics and relationships and, and all of these things. <clears throat> if I was to say to you, Ed, why didn't you tell me? I just assaulted your character, whether I meant to or yeah, not. Yeah, on defense I already. I hit every single tripwire you knew you had and a few you didn't even know you had. Yeah. So instead, there's a concept we like to call illustrate before you investigate. I want to show a little bit of understanding of the situation before I pop the question. And then the question is going to follow the same tenets from the last example. So now if the question is along the lines of, hey, I need to, even as even running the organization, I need to be able to take a step back and understand that when we ask people to think like leaders, that they are going to try to take control of certain situations and handle them themselves, because essentially that's what we've asked them to do, even if we wish the situation was handled or not. So I'm just curious, in this specific situation, what outcomes were you working towards achieving before you felt you needed to bring this to my attention? So now they can say, yeah, I mean, it, thinking like a leader, I was trying to do one, two, three, and they didn't work. So then I came to tell you. So now, not only am I making it easier for them to tell me the truth, but from your curiosity question, I'm giving myself an opportunity to learn because maybe their thought process was spot on, but their execution was off course. 
So now I can reinforce the great thought process and teach on the on the execution. If the thought process was off, now I can coach the thought process and hopefully avoid making this or any related mistakes in the future, or at least reduce them, because we're able to address the thought process behind it. So it really does come down to helping people save face. And um, now I forgot the second one. Here we are. Mm-hmm. Helping people save face and focusing on the issue, not the person going through those conversations. All too often, people ask questions based on what they want to say not what the other person needs to experience to choose to share the information. And yeah. it might sound small, but that switch is a big one. Yeah. As you were talking, I was th- going back to one of the habits in Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people seek first to understand then to be understood. And I think if you could sum up, well, you can't sum up great communication in one phrase, but certainly that's a great phrase to use to, to get you there. Yeah, I would imagine that. Um, so let's just let's just stay there for a second. So, so many leaders, and I'll I'll call them, you know, the, whether they're Type A or whether they're leaders or managers or executives, whatever their role is, oftentimes we'll we'll communicate with the objective of being understood. I'm here standing up on the mountain to speak to my masses, and I want you to understand me. Um, how does that, when you hear that phrase, seek first to understand, then to be understood, what does that do for you? What is, how does that resonate with, with you, with what we've talked about and with the work you do? Yeah, I would agree that it, it comes pretty close to summarizing, you know, good communication in you know, one sentence, if we could ever get there. Yeah. Um, to me, we communicate for a reason. Like, to be completely honest, I love our conversations. I love teaching. But if somebody was to walk by me in the grocery store or see me at a networking event, I'm going to be the guy with my head down or leaning up against the bar drinking a Guinness by myself. I'm introverted, borderline antisocial, but huh. not engaging yeah. in topics and things that I truly enjoy. Yeah, I've never been um, called that, just so you know. <laughs> I get more introverted as I get older. I like my alone time and my quiet time and my, you know, drive time with nothing on in the car just to be in my yeah. thoughts, but I'm still yep. looking for people all the time. Anyway, yeah. I've certainly got that impression. So thank you for dragging me out. I really, yeah, no problem. It. Yeah. Pulled you out, uh, of your, out of your cage this morning. Yes. Yeah. Um, or away from your Guinness. It is three hours later where you are. So, you know, it is afternoon already on Friday where you are. So who knows if I needed the justification, you're right. You <laughs> um, now you got me thinking about Guinness. Exactly. We communicate for a reason. So if we look about business, why, if I'm a leader in a business, why am I talking to somebody else? Because I need to gather information slash intelligence, the really important pieces that are sometimes hidden from somebody in order to make a decision that is going to move a relationship, an initiative, or the business itself forward. So there's value in here, or I wouldn't be having the conversation. So because these conversations happen for a reason, in order for me to get what I want, like, as pragmatically as I can possibly say this, in order for me to get what I want, I have to understand where you're coming from and where you are. If I can't understand where you're coming from and where you are, then all I can do at best is force compliance. And by forcing compliance, I'm going to get shoddy work, shoddy commitment, poor morale. A good person might leave or worse, they'll stay and do a terrible job because they think I don't care about them. You know, all of of those things that we hear so often. So, 20 minutes later to get back and ask what was probably a two second question to seek to understand first in many ways, not only speaks to emotional intelligence and empathy and the power of human connection and all these things that we've talked about, but pragmatically it speaks to gathering the intelligence necessary in order to achieve the goal behind the conversation to begin with. Yeah. I like that. As I, as you're talking, I'm thinking about company culture. We've done some webinars here at First Bank. And also, uh, it seems to be a topic that's come up a lot since COVID. It's always been a topic, but since COVID with everybody, you know, moving towards a different work environment, not everybody's going to work from home, not everybody's hybrid, but there's been a lot of shifts in the workforce, which in, 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 as a result of that causes a shift in culture. And that's the word I'm, I'm, I'm teeing up for you right now. In, in your work, in, the, in this discipline listening, I guess I want to ask, how does becoming a better listener as an executive, as a, as a leader in a company, 
influence the culture from the work you've done? I've looked at your site. You've worked with some amazing companies over the years. You're continuing to do great work with a lot of different great organizations. What shifts in culture have you seen just by people implementing some of the things that you're teaching them? Significant. To put it, to try to to follow your lead and simplify things into one sentence successfully or otherwise. Um, By the way, I'm I'm that same guy you were talking about. I'm guilty of using a thousand words to say what I could have said into that question could have been culture. How does it work? (laughs) Or whatever. Either way. (laughs) Um, Our perception as leaders, how people perceive us as leaders is built on how they perceive us as listeners. So when it comes to improving, evolving, maximizing the culture of our organizations, in my, okay, probably biased opinion, it starts with listening. Because if people don't think you're listening, they don't think you care. And if they don't think you care, there's no reason for them to listen or change their behavior. Or to care. If the leader doesn't care, why should I? So one rhetorical challenge I would throw out there is if a leader is standing on top of the mountain talking to the masses, as you, as you said, are they really seeking to be understood or are they seeking to be respected and followed? Hmm. Because those are two different things, potentially three different things. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to using listening as a culture driving tool, it is one of the cornerstones. And I honestly believe there are some small things that organizations can implement that cost zero dollars and can save thousands upon thousands, tens, maybe hundreds, depending on the size of the organization, on the money that they're spending on their culture improvement programs. Literally just one. And I know that there are many, many other people that say this besides me. Don't ever walk by somebody without saying hello, yeah. ever, under any circumstances. I don't care. Mookie Betts could be walking down the hall with you. Say hi to every single person you walk past. And if you can't because Mookie's talking and you don't want to be disrespectful, at least make eye contact, smile and nod so they know you saw them. You walk by without acknowledging them. You're literally telling them you don't exist in my business. Another one is the accidental idea thief. How many times does somebody come to us and say, hey, Mike, I got a question. Can you tell me how to do X, Y, Z? And because we've all been through the same leadership courses, I don't just say, yes, here's how to do it. I say, well, what's your goal? And what options have mm-hmm. you thought through? And what have you tried? And, you know, working through the whole thing. And at the end, okay, so what do you think your best alternative is? And when they say, well, I believe I should do X, Y, Z. If I say, great idea, that's exactly what I was thinking. Hmm. I just Validates. stole the idea from them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. It's oh, not yeah. what I was trying to do, but it's, it's what's perceived that yeah. I did. Instead of just saying, great idea, go. If you need help, ask. Let me know. Um, And the third one is somebody that comes to you and says, hey, Ed, do you have a minute? And you don't because you've got to be in a meeting with Hector in three minutes. Right. So you could say, well, I'd love to help, but I've got a meeting with Hector in three minutes. What do you need? Unintentionally, you just told that person you're not worth four minutes of my life. Yeah. And there's exceptions that prove every rule. Yeah. More often than not, I'm willing to bet that it's going to take somebody less than three to five minutes to tell you what their problem is. Yeah. It might feel like an hour and a half, depending on the person in the situation, but it's typically only a couple of minutes. So instead now, if you were to say, yeah, Mike, what do you need? You let me tell you first and then say, I will definitely help you with that. I do have to be to Hector's office in one minute. I don't want to be late. He gets pretty upset when I'm late. Um, yeah, exactly. I don't want to make Hector mad. No, but... no. I'm sorry, Hector. Couldn't resist. Yeah. Um, but I do have to be at Hector's office in one minute. I should be done with that conversation by two o'clock. Please come by my office and interrupt me and we will take care of it then. So now I've done a couple of things. By listening to them first, they literally feel heard, listened to because I didn't cut them off. So now their react, their emotional reaction is different. I listened before I told them I didn't have the time. Then I gave them a window where I'll be back. And by using the word interrupt, word choice matters. If I was just to say, come see me. Oh, well, he's busy. I'm not sure I want to go in there. But if I say interrupt me. Yeah. I've now illustrated that this is important. Yeah. Whatever I'm working on, you come interrupt me and we'll do this. Yeah, I like that. You shared a little bit about that in our last conversation, too. And I remember having that thought uh, and I've tried to implement this since that conversation. If that happens in my now I'm working from home most of the time. But if I am out in a 
you know, I have an office down in Newport beach that I go to regularly and, you know, other offices that I'm visiting quite a bit. And if I'm in that situation where it's three minutes till 10 and I've got a meeting at 10 and you come into my office with an idea, you know, what I'm trying to do now is, Hey, can you walk with me to my meeting and, and share with me what this is? And then, you know what, this meeting's over at 11, send me an outlook invite for 11 AM, put the topic and then come back in and let's sit down and talk. So they know I've listened I, the idea is important. Let's get it on the calendar or, Hey, I've got this meeting at 10, but I'm going to come right over to your office right after, or, you know, what's this about? Well, I have an idea about how we can streamline things in the warehouse. Okay. So let's have that, that warehouse streamlining conversation at 11 o'clock. And if there's anybody else that you think should be there in this conversation, great. If not, let's just talk. So yeah, it, like you said, people just want to know that they've been listened to and, and you can't fake caring. That's the other thing too. It's like, people can read right through that. How, how can you tell, if someone is fake listening or fake caring. Inconsistency or incongruency is, are typically the two words that I go to. Um, oftentimes the words don't match the behavior. So if somebody is faking an emotion, that emotion doesn't match what they're saying or it doesn't happen at the same time. So the, the cheesiest and easiest example is I say, if I say I'm happy and I'm really happy, it should look like this. I'm happy. I'm yeah. smiling. Tell your, tell your, your face, right? Yeah. Yeah. But if I say, yeah, I'm happy, like yeah. the smile wasn't on time to the words. You know, it wasn't that, on that time, yeah. yeah like that, that doesn't add up. So typically the inconsistency or the incongruency. Um, incongruency is big. The consistency is difficult. The shorter the time, the easier it is to fake something. But the longer that time goes on, the harder it is to keep up the act. So the, the consistency tends to wane the longer the conversation goes. Yeah. So let's talk about this now. Let, let me give you just a a scenario, not naming names, because I don't have any company in mind. I have a lot of family businesses that are at that point right now where they're considering a transition from leadership. I've had many, what I refer to as the now generation, the mom or the dad who's, you know, pushing that age of ready to retire, whatever that number is for them. Sometimes it's 60, sometimes it's 90. I've run across all of it, but they're ready to have that conversation. But the big issue they're facing is either they don't have the right family member, child, or niece, nephew, what have you ready to take over, or they have multiple and they're trying to make that decision in the work that you've done. I know you've done a fair amount of work with family owned companies, maybe intentionally, maybe otherwise with family companies. What have you seen that works in conversations with that, that now generation, if you will, Sure. Um, what types of questions as a, as a consultant or as a, as an advisor to these family businesses, would you encourage me and others that do the work that I do yeah. to ask that generation or, or anybody in that matter when they're coming up on a succession or transition conversation? Sure. A um, couple thoughts and potentially an unrelated, but very related story. I think I can share after if there's time. Um, the first question I would ask them is what is the detailed description or, or please read to me, recount to me the detailed description of the perfect successor, hmm. which I'm willing to bet most of all don't have. Yeah. Because what happens is, or let me go, let me do it this way, I guess. If somebody was to bring me in from the start to prepare for these conversations, the first thing I would ask the generation currently in control of the organization to do is from their perspective, write out what problems they believe the next person needs to be able to solve, address, what skills they believe they think they need to do that, what attributes they think they need to do that. So basically it becomes, it's a word that people don't like, but it becomes a profile of what the successor should be. It has nothing to do with age, gender, race, none of that stuff, but these are the problems they're going to need to solve. To do that, we think they need these skills and we think they need the, these personal attributes. Okay, cool. Who comes closest to that? Yeah. Because what happens is without that control, here I am going all scientific method and I'm not a scientist. Without that control, we're comparing variables. So now I'm looking at Susie and Johnny going, you know, I'm not so sure, but maybe Johnny, it could be Susie. I don't really like Jared, but he went to Harvard. So maybe we yeah, should exactly. consider him. Yeah. Like, so like you're comparing variables based on gut feelings and the guesses or assumptions. Whereas if we take the time and say all the lessons we've learned in this business, we don't have all the answers. Of course, there, there's a future here that we can't fully account for, but based on what we know, these are the problems. These are the skills. These are the attributes who fits that. Yeah. 
that to me, that's where it starts because now you actually have a plan. You have a, and if, if there's not somebody now I could say, okay, well, you know, Susie's kind of lacking in this area and Johnny's kind of lacking in that area. So now we've got options, right? Do we split this up? Do we create a partnership? Do we offer education opportunities, formal or informal to both of them and see if we can educate one or both of them up to end up being the best choice. I mean, it gives you options once we understand what we need versus what we have. You know, it's just like, yeah, it's just like applying for a job. Now, if I'm not in a family business and I, you know, we've all, I don't know about you have, because you've been running your own company for quite some time, but, you know, I think most of us have looked at job descriptions or postings on LinkedIn or wherever and go, wow, they wrote that for me. It's almost like they had me in mind when they wrote that. And then I apply Mm -hmm. and I don't even get an interview. That happens to a lot of people. Other times you apply and they're like, wow, we've been waiting for you. And I, I see in family business at times that they're, they're so busy grooming their proposed successor that the job, and certainly there's a fair amount of, you know, my son is the right person to take over when I do. I've been grooming him since he was a child, but I might be, I might have the tendency to write the job description around him yes. rather than around the job. That's yes. what I'm hearing you say, write out what the, what, yes. what the best successor looks like. And sometimes it might have to come from the outside. And like you said, sometimes Johnny or Susie might need to go get some additional training. You know, we're, most of us aren't qualified for the job we get. You know, we qualify ourselves while doing the job. So certainly there's a fair amount of, you know, hey, you know, what what part of this can we bend on a little bit and they can grow into? So, no, I like that a lot. That's, that's really good, really good advice. Okay. So one of the things that you mentioned, and I'm and it's sort of loosely on the same topic, you, you talk on your site and in your book a little bit about candidate interviewing yes. as you're interviewing candidates for jobs. So mm-hmm. a good friend of mine, Meredith Elliott Powell, who you may or may not have met, she's out there on the East coast. She was on a webinar we did recently uh, here at the, at first bank. Um, she wrote a book called who comes next. And it's all about, you know, not just succession planning from, you know, owner to owner and, leader to leader, but it could be HR director to HR director, purchasing manager to purchasing manager, whatever that transition is. As you take the discipline listening method and the work that you do at Inquasive into that teaching people how to interview candidates, what are some of the top things you're looking for? Not so much in the search because you're not a job search company, but now you're actually in that conversation of the interview. Walk me through that a little bit and what kind of coaching you give in that situation. Looking for some free advice here. No, got it. No, and you just hit on one of the three core pillars of what I do. So I, we can spend as much time here as you want. Um, a lot of the same concepts and challenges apply to the conversation we just had about succession to this. So do I have an ideal candidate profile? Do I know the outcomes, this position, the skills and attributes from this position? Once we get into the interview itself, try to keep this short for now. I really looked at, at two different, I guess, three. Number one, the interview process the questions we ask, and then any experiential elements. So the interview process, if you're putting somebody through four interviews and they're getting asked 65% of the same questions in all four interviews, then three of those interviews are useless. So if they're going to go through three or four interviews, who are they interviewing with and why? And what questions are each one of those interviewers asking based on their role, their experience, their oversight of the position, their interaction with the position, whatever it might be. So if there's somebody who does like intake interviews, just to kind of get through the the big group and narrow it down. Okay, what do we really want them asking about? What are the core things we need to know about these candidates before we actually put them into the real process? Okay, so once they get into the real process, Do they start with HR or their frontline manager? I'm not here to tell you which way. Whatever you want to do is fine. Right. So let's just say they start with the frontline manager. What does the frontline manager really need to learn from them in order to say, yes, I will put them forward? Once that's done, what is the next level manager? It's called the operations manager. What does the operations manager need to learn from them to say, yes, this is a good fit for my team? That doesn't overlap what the frontline manager already did. Right. And then if it's going to be HR last or a general manager last or something from their role, from an overall culture fit and these types of things, what should their questions sound like? So that from a structure, that's an oversimplification, but that's addressing that from the questions that we ask for the love of everything. Holy, (laughs) please stop asking questions that start with the phrase 
tell me about a time. I know it's been taught forever. And I know people might have just turned us off because I just said, don't do the thing they've always been doing. The thought process behind it is spectacular. The execution is the problem. Number one, especially now, candidates have been asked, tell me about a time you've X, Y, Z four million times. Right. They're prepared to answer it. There's Google. They're, they're, they'll tell you how to answer those Yeah, questions. exactly. You can just memorize two, it. Yeah. From an evaluation standpoint, the way it lands on their brain, it gives them poetic license and the ability to skip around and integrate pieces from different stories that may or may not be theirs. It makes it very difficult for us to know that because of how we ask the question. So it literally gives the advantage to the answerer, not the inquirer. A very small tweak will help with that. So instead of saying, tell me about a time, ask for a specific time. When was the first time? When was the last time? When was the most difficult time? When was the most significant time? When was the most surprising time? What was the most satisfying time? Shall I continue? Like ask right. for a specific example. Now the way that lands in their brain, they're being asked in a way they probably have never been asked before. Right. It causes them to consider their answer differently. It gives us a much more accurate behavioral read as they consider and deliver their answer. So making that switch, number one, is critical. The second one is, again, for all things holy. <laughs> Please stop asking compound questions. You know, Ed, please tell me about a time where you experienced conflict with a manager or senior executive and walk me through that. Probably, that's my favorite thing. So I got to get away from that. Please yeah. tell me about a time that you experienced conflict with a senior executive, what the conflict was about, how it started, how it made you feel, how you handled it, how that situation ended and what you learned from it. And then what did you have for breakfast that morning? Yeah. So now they're not like, only, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not only are you not going to remember to answer all of those again, I'm scrambling your brain. So I'm mm -hmm. not going to get a good behavior. read. I'm also likely going to lose patience by the time you answer all those yeah. questions. So I'm not going to go back. I'm going to listen for a few key things, check the box one way or the other and move on. So in that I gave what is my single favorite introductory phrase for a question. Please walk me. Please walk me through suggests that I expect chronological order and detail. And it makes it easier for me to determine when either one of those is missing because of how I asked the question. So now I could just say, Ed, please walk me through the most significant conflict you've navigated with the senior executive. That's it. That's the question. Yeah. And then I sit here and let you go. Mm -hmm. And when you're done, if you didn't tell me what the conflict was or what you learned from it or what you do differently or some of these other things, I can come back and ask a follow up question. But I'm letting you choose where it starts, where it ends, what you share, the detail and order you share it in. And you're likely to get much more intelligence, not only with the answer itself, but how long does it take them to create the answer and what details do they choose to share and how does it hop around and all of those things. So even just to tweak that for a family business example. Um, so let's say that I'm talking to somebody who is from a younger generation who's aspiring for a higher role, either within this organization or outside or wherever it might be. Um, maybe I'll ask them, um, what's the hardest? Uh, please walk me through the hardest you ever had to work to persuade a senior member of your family to accept one of your recommended changes at work. I love that because right away you're, you're not getting them to, because you know, going back to the, tell me about, they might tell me about is going to right away lead someone to just start talking and then yeah. they're eventually going to get to the answer and I'm guilty as charged. And, I'm hoping that from episode 78, which is this one of the From the Heart podcast, episode 79 on will get better because I'll ask better questions because I'm guilty of asking the compound questions and I'm guilty of the tell me about. Yeah. So when you say to someone, what's a time when you had to communicate a difficult message to a family member or to a customer, et cetera, you're also teeing it up, I think, for something that happens that a lot of people are very uncomfortable with and that's silence. 
because if I ask you a question to tell me about, you're going to just start talking because I'm at, I'm giving you a license to just start rambling. What is a time when you're going to have to stop and think for a minute. So I'm probably teeing you up for seconds, which feels like moments, which can be interpreted as hours of silence. Talk about that silence, that gap between the question and the beginning of the answer. And what can we look for in that silence? I, I don't even know how to ask that question, but if I just say it's going to create some silence, what does that do for you? Let it breathe. When you are the interviewer, silence is your friend. And I'm not saying that is like the big bad interrogator, make them sweat. You don't want to do that in a job interview. You don't want to make them sweat in a job interview, but I don't want to let them off the hook either. So if I ask somebody a question and it's taking them five, six, seven seconds to think of an answer, which in a candidate interview feels like five, six, seven hours, right? let them go, let them go. If they look at you, give them a polite smile, give them a little polite, slight head nod. Sometimes, I don't know if you can see my, this is going to look unnatural because we're on Zoom. It, my hand will be resting on my knee if this was an actual interview, but I might even do something like this. Like I just kind of turn my palm up and nod my head. Like take mm -hmm. take your time. Give me yeah, a little slight okay. yeah, shot. No like, rush. Yeah, take your time, man. I'm good. Like, so I don't mean to turn up the heat on them. Please don't take it that way. But let the silence breathe. I asked you a question. It's your turn to talk. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if I jump in and let them off the hook, that's probably because of my discomfort with the silence, not their discomfort with the silence. And I need to realize that silence is a natural part of this process. If I'm going to ask somebody a question that they didn't have time to prepare for, I should expect a period of silence before they answered it because they're trying to thoughtfully answer the question. So let it breathe, let them answer it. I don't want to assume that my level of discomfort equates to their level of discomfort. Therefore it needs to be removed. No, let them go. Time is the enemy of empathy. All too often, if we're prioritizing the time, well, I, they need to answer. I've got the next question. I got another meeting. Then we are deprioritizing the value of the relationship and the conversation. Just let the silence breathe. Give them time to answer. Okay. Can I practice? Please. In real time with the real interview with you. Yeah. I'm going to try to do my job here differently based on the things you just shared with me. And you can either answer the question or coach me on how I could have asked it better or both. Okay. Walk me through the process of, of deciding to write the book, Disciplined Listening. Arduous. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question was fine. I like to say, please, I'm, and I'm going to answer your question, yeah. by the way, but just before I forget what you said, um, whenever possible, just out of like a polite function, I like to say, yeah. please walk. Please and thank you. Deal. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, please walk me through the thought process of deciding to write, but that was fine. I thought that was a good question. Um, for me, I actually, the call I was on before logging in with you, I wrote the book, honestly, out of necessity. I didn't grow up wanting to be a business owner. I didn't grow up wanting to be an author. Those things happen because they needed to happen. Like it's, I didn't have a choice. I had to do these things. Um, so I know you, I mean, like we've never been in the same room, but we've had a lot of conversations. It was in the beginning, it was the toughest thing I've ever done um, because of my mental deficiencies. So going through the emotional roller coaster of getting started. Um, some of it is predictable. You know, who's going to read this? Are they going to like it? You know, those kinds of things. Um, yeah, I was fully prepared for somebody to say this isn't for me or I disagree with that. That's fine. The one thing that I worked extremely hard with the publisher to make sure we avoided was plagiarism. Like I don't, somebody tells me they don't like it. I don't care. Somebody wants to tell me that doesn't work. I don't care. Somebody's going to tell me that. No, no, no. That's somebody else. I do care a lot. So that was my one, like real yeah, word thing. for word. I just read that in Simon Sinek's book. What are you doing here? Right? Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. the stuff you got to be careful. With. Coincidence. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but, but you know, outside of that, the going through, I mean, I'll just tell you there were, it was a roller coaster that, really shifted between anger and depression for months anytime I sat down to start writing. And most of that was fueled by why hadn't I done it already and feeling like a failure because I hadn't already done it. So, and probably too much information, that's 
that was by far the hardest part for me. And then quite honestly, that might've been close to a year that mm-hmm. I dealt with that false starts writing the book. Uh, but once I finally forced myself to get into it, probably like anything else, it started slow. It kind of grew and morphed organically as I was doing the research. So my original table of contents and what ended up are probably like 65% different. Um, I ended up loving it, the process, because I got to continue to learn. I got to continue to evolve. Um, it was frustrating at times because not ever planning on writing a book, I didn't keep notes from all the interrogations I'd ever done and all the situations I'd ever been. So I felt like I wasted days at a time, literally trying to go back and remember cases from different periods of my career. So I would have stories. Um, so, and then probably by the time I was halfway into it, I was in a rhythm. And once I was in a rhythm, it was great. Um, I got to give all kinds of thanks and appreciation to my wife, who took on additional time and responsibilities with our young son in order to give me the time to free up and write. So, you know, none of this happens without her, of course. Um, going through the process with the publisher, I enjoyed. You know, one of the things that I knew up front was I'm going to work as hard as I possibly can to turn over a manuscript that's going to get shredded, and I'm okay with that. Right. Um, Develop some I, thick skin. Yeah. And, but again, the learning process in that was huge. So when it comes time to write the second book, I'm so far ahead of the game compared to where I was in this one and then getting it done and getting it published. Um, it will be out a year this March 15th, which is actually significant. And again, I have to give the publisher a lot of credit. Um, they worked with me to get it published on my mom's birthday. Oh, so nice. it was a, a big thank you to my mom and my family. So in the end, it's something that I am very proud of and very happy to have done. I can't read it without thinking, oh, I should have added this there. I should have done this here. That's why you write uh, a second book. Yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, very emotional, uh, but a, a great learning experience and one that I'm thrilled to be able to say I accomplished. And I would like to think accomplished well. The book's had an impact. What has surprised you or humbled or taught you in what the impact of the book has had on you and on your business and on your life? I think on me, just doing it. Like at some point I had to tell myself, and no offense to everybody else who's written a book, I know you have as well. I had to just look in the mirror and be like, the only difference between me and them is they did it. (laughs) Like so, So just knock this noise off and go do it. Um, So, you know, just getting it done and getting it done to the level of quality with the level of research involved was very important to me. So that satisfies me. That is is very humbling to me and and gratifying to know that, you know, mission accomplished. I didn't half ass it. I didn't. Sorry for cursing. I apologize. Um, Podcast. We're not we're not governed by the FCC. Go right ahead. I didn't take any shortcuts. I did it the way that I thought it needed to be done. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Um, I'm extremely grateful for the impact that it's had on my family to see my wife's reaction and my parents' reaction and my closest friends' reactions, you know, stuff like that. That's all super, super important. Um, as far as the impact on the business in the, in the greater people, I'm always humbled slash, grateful, surprised. I mean, there's so many words when the email pops up or the LinkedIn message pops up or the phone call comes up and it's like, Hey, I was just reading your book and read this page and it completely changed my relationship with my customer, my employee, my son, whatever. Um, So those, you know, we all get to have an impact on people in some way, shape or form in our life. And there are certainly millions of people that have had a far greater impact than I ever will. But just to be able to have that kind of impact on people in a positive way is such a fortunate opportunity. Yeah. Lots of questions I could ask, and I know time is of the essence here. So I did want to, and I, I, I let you know this prior to starting the recording here on your website. So share with, first of all, how can people reach you through your website and what have you to get a copy of your book or, or inquire about Inquasive and what you can do <laughs> for them? What's the best way to get in touch with you? I appreciate that. So for the book, it's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. If they want to check the book out before purchasing, they can go to disciplinedlistening.com, which I think is where your question is going. And, and, and they can preview the book there. 
Um, if they want to learn more about me and the work that I do, they can go to michaelreddington.com where they will find this episode as soon as it's alive and shared. I'll make sure that I embed it there with all the other work that I've done. If they want to learn more about Inquasive and the work that we do with organizations who are committed to changing their culture of communication, be it within their leadership group, with their business development group or their HR group, typically candidate interviewing would some one of the topics we already talked about on the HR side, they can go to Inquasive.com, I-N-Q-U-A-S-I-V-E.com for that. Um, really the only social media I'm on is LinkedIn. So if yeah. they want to search Michael Reddington CFI on LinkedIn, I would be thrilled to connect with anyone who has taken the time to listen to this conversation. And obviously we'll put all of that in the notes on this podcast. And for my listeners and viewers, reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with Michael as well. Sure. Um, okay. So the last, we'll have two, two questions left. Um, the first one is on your website, you chose to put chapter four as a sample reading you could have chosen any chapter that chapter i think is called letting go of lies why that chapter and in whatever time you want to take here i know your time is is i know you have another place to go here in a little bit and so do i but why that chapter on letting go of lies such a loaded question i know it is but i I prepped you (laughs) (laughs) um so for me One of the biggest lessons I learned in a career in interview and interrogation is to never get mad when someone lies to me because they are executing what they believe to be their last good available option in that situation. Hmm. It has nothing to do with me. They're not lying to hurt me. They're lying to protect themselves. And Tim Levine's research backs that up entirely, where he shows that the vast majority of time people lie to protect themselves, not to hurt other people. So, we all have this and it varies culturally and personally. And so I don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but forgive me for the, for the expression. We all in some way, shape or form have this moral attachment to honesty and dishonesty. And when we believe somebody has lied to us, that generally infuriates us, disappoints us, infuriates us somewhere on that negative scale of emotional reaction for a number of reasons. We feel disrespected. We feel hurt. We feel that somebody tried to take advantage of us. Somebody thinks we're gullible. Somebody doesn't love us or value us. Somebody doesn't have the same moral code or the same values or the same ethical code that we do. So we cast this judgment upon them. All of that is unhealthy. All of it. It might be inaccurate. It's definitely unhealthy. When somebody lies to us, they are Almost certainly, and I'm leaving out the medical diagnoses and you know some of these career criminals and, and all this, but for the conversations that you the and I are having in business, right. Damn it, right? People are lying to us and using it as a mechanism to save face, protect their self-image, and avoid a consequence that's either real or perceived. Hmm. It has nothing to do with me or you. That's why they're lying. By the way, it's why we all have lied. And just as a crazy aside. In writing the book, one of the research studies I found was, believe it or not, altruistic lies have been found by research to help boost somebody's trustworthiness. Because if you're willing to lie at your own expense to help somebody out, you must be more trustworthy. So we've all told lies. Okay. I'm not saying that, you know, you're a terrible person. I'm a terrible person. But we've all, in any number of occasions, to any number of degree, told lies. So to finally start answering your question, I chose to use that chapter to start to try to address on a wider scale what we just talked about, to really start trying to cause people to give real reconsideration to how they listen, to how they react, to the expectations and actions they take during their conversations, and also to demonstrate the direction the book was going. I've read some great books on listening that I recommend to people. I've read some that that are kind of, you know, par for the course. Um, And I wanted to find a way to illustrate that this is coming from a different angle. And this is going to include research and stories and examples from a wide array of applications. And believe it or not, I'm very fortunate to have been in an industry where I was required to have conversations with people who did not want to talk to me. And by building relationships with them, 
in the context of interview and interrogation that led them to choose to share sensitive information under vulnerable circumstances in the face of consequences. We can apply those skills, perspectives, and techniques to these day-to-day conversations, and the value that we can start unlocking is tremendous. And I really felt like throwing that chapter out there for pe- to give people the opportunity to say, wait a minute, if I, if instead of getting mad that somebody lied, if I stopped and thought, wait a minute, what consequences are they trying to avoid? And now if I can change my approach to this conversation to reduce that fear, imagine how much more information they'll share with me. Yeah. And if they even just take that away, we've already made evolutions, leaps and bounds. Well, and it gets back, back to what we talked about early on and that why. Mm-hmm. Why did they say what they said? Why did they tell it this way? Why did they stretch the truth? Why did they just blatantly lie? So there's always a why behind it. So trying to really uncover that in part three of this conversation, because this is part two, because we, we did this last year, uh, we will probably dive deeper into that and also some other areas. Um, the book Discipline Listening, it's a great book. I think any anyone that listens to or watches this podcast should read this book. And I'm not just plugging it because Mike's a good friend and a great guy, which he is. But I really do believe that the techniques that you will learn as you as you see his work and read his work and his thoughts and, and what he talks about, it will change the way you lead your business and the way you ask questions. And one of the things you mentioned in our first podcast conversation was, and I've, I've shared this so many times in so many different scenarios that I can't remember even one example because it's just part of me now, is that the, the, the idea behind, we all always everybody thinks we need to be listening to understand people. And we really need to, you know, we learn more by listening, but you talked a lot about, and I'm paraphrasing you that as we're, as we're speaking, we can interpret, you know, guilty or not guilty, listening or not listening, engaged or not engaged. How does that work? If I'm talking to you, I know I'm going over here and I do still have that last question, but if I'm talking to you right now and I'm the one speaking, how am I learning about you while I'm talking? By assessing my reactions as you speak. So when a behavior change occurs, it's far more important than what behavior change occurs. And to circle back to your last conversation, let's throw away catching people lying because anything you've ever been told that people do when they lie is BS. Mm-hmm. It's We'll get into that maybe in part four. Your nose doesn't actually grow, huh, Pinocchio? No, yeah. no. It would make my life a lot easier if it did. Sure would. Although yeah. you'd be out of money too because you know if, people, if that happened, then we wouldn't need you. It'd be all figured out. There you go. But what I want to look for are peaks and valleys, changes in their levels of comfort. So as I'm communicating, especially if I'm familiar with what I'm saying, and I don't have to waste all those cognitive resources on coming up with what I'm going to say, now I can react or, 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 or at least take in how you're reacting to me. So on time to what I'm saying, how are you reacting? I got to be a little bit cognizant if we're in a crowded restaurant and there's people moving around and lights flashing and sounds going off, you know, you could be reacting to that and not to me, but if we're in a relatively calm environment and you're focused on me sitting a couple feet away and we're having this conversation, if I'm focusing on you while I'm talking, not focusing on what I want to say. Yeah. As your emotions change on the inside, they're going to leak on the outside. And if Mm. I can in real time, tie your change to exactly what I just said and evaluate that in the context of the situation, I should be able to pinpoint pretty close to exactly what you're thinking. I hear the term certified forensic interviewer, like a lot of people do. And it, you know, I, I, I start thinking of CSI and all these TV shows and, you know, throwing the chair across the investigation room. And, and uh, I know that's not what you do, but what, is that the reaction you get from people if you're on an elevator and you have that, you know, what do you do? I'm a certified forensic investi- investigator. You know, your coolness factor just went way up because that's pretty cool because we've all seen the shows. What is it really? It's two people having a conversation that sounds a lot like this. Like if I was able to show videos of the interrogations that I've conducted, which I have, I'm just not allowed to show um, for many reasons that are easy to understand. Mm-hmm people would likely be disappointed right up until the time the person started confessing because the drama is non-existent. It's two people having a quiet, calm conversation until all of a sudden one of those people is confessing to some regrettable decisions that they made in great detail and preparing to write it down. And at that point, the other person watching, but they waited, what just happened? 
Yeah. Well, you'll be surprised what people will tell you when you're nice to them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Mike, um, because of time, I'm going to wrap it up, but thank you for taking the time to be with me again today. I'm grateful for you as a friend. Um, we have a lot more conversations you and I do than what we record. We've only recorded maybe now three because we did a webinar that's back right, in the previous right. life of mine as well yeah. when I was running the center at Cal State Fullerton. Um, because why is really the 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 word that drives me when I talk to family businesses. I talk to a you know a family business will call me the the leader will call me and say. I need some training for my executive team, or I need to know how to handle such and such. My first question is always going to be why. So in a different way of asking you why, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked you once before. And I ask all my guests, this will be the 78th time I've asked this question and recorded it. Michael Reddington, what's in your heart? I'd be interested to go back and compare this answer to the last one and, and see how close they are. Cause I have no recollection of, of answering this. Nor do I. Um, you know, for me, it is how many people can I touch and how many people can I help and what different ways can I do that from coaching new sports to doing what I do professionally to making the time for friends and family and those kinds of things. Um, you know, we're all, fortunate to have the opportunity just to be here and me more so probably than a lot of other people not all but probably a lot um so to to have the opportunity to have that positive impact it's it's a real 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 fortunate opportunity for me so what's in my heart is to maximize that 